Welcome to another episode of the Fitness Oracle. I am your host, John Gonzalez. Today, we are joined by Daniel McQueen of McQueenDan.com, who shares his inspiring story of overcoming a life-changing brain hemorrhage at 28. Dan's resilience and determination led him on a journey of relearning everything he once knew to returning to his job share and sharing his practical approach to try to triumph over adversity with others in our conversation we cover various topics including his road to recovery naked walks swallowing the hairy frog morning routines and overcoming obstacles if you're a podcaster struggling to balance your business with your health and wellness Check out Resilient Rebu Productions. Our community of expert podcasters provides the tools, resources, and support you need to build a thriving podcasting business. While prioritizing your well-being, join us now and discover how to create a sustainable, fulfilling career in podcasting that lets you live your best life. Don't let burnout stand in the way of your dreams. Join Resilient Rebu Productions today. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Pleasure to be here. So how's the prep for the next uh, talking gig that you got coming up? How's that coming along? It's going well. I spoke at a school on Monday and uh, always interesting to speak in front of their grade 10. So interesting to see their reaction to what I'm talking about and stuff. It's a bit on the cusp of what they can understand because it's quite deep and um, maybe a bit I don't want to say meta because that's got a bad connotation to it now, but more maybe more like um, higher level than they could comprehend. But uh, it's been going well. Thank you for asking. Awesome, awesome. That's really good to hear. Um, what first got you interested in this line of work? Speaking well, initially, this talk that I created was birthed out of a, me speaking to outpatients at my former rehab center in Wolfson in London a chance to kind of give back to showcase them how I navigated this inroads and created this world that um, made rehab, I don't want to say fun, but maybe more pleasant than it would otherwise be. And the lessons I learned there were so valuable. I thought I should share that with outpatients and, and let them know what's going on. So this talk that I give now is, is birthed out of that um, with some changes and stuff. Obviously it's kind of customized to depending on who I'm speaking with, but it started out with giving back to outpatients. That's why I kind of got into this line of work. Very cool. Very cool. Um, you're in London, Ontario? No, sir. That was in London, UK. In oh, jolly old okay. England. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. I'm in Vancouver now, but I was in jolly old England for the past 10 years. Very nice. I've always wanted to go to London, but never have Yet. Yet. I haven't done it yet, man. Well, London's a great spot. It's a great city. It's not where I envisioned myself long term, but I ended up staying there for 10 years. So I can't really say that. But it's a place that is always gonna have a special place in my heart, but it's not it's not home, if that makes sense. 100 percent that makes sense. 100 percent Um have there any been have there been any moments where you've just said, you know what, enough is enough. I'm just gonna go back to what I was doing before. I don't want to deal with any of this stuff anymore because it's just not going right. Yeah. Like it's been really frustrating. I've lost my job in August. It's part of a restructuring at Hootsuite of part of 400 people that got let go that day. So mass restructuring. And I was let go from a job I had for nine years, uh, nine of those or eight of those years in London, one of those years in Vancouver. And it was a great gig, great company, great work. I enjoyed my work. I was presenting and training in front of people. And moving into the speaking world has been extremely frustrating. One step forward, three steps back. Been days where I've pulled my hair out and days where I've loved it. You know, the highs are super high, the lows are super low. But it's when you know what you're meant to do in this world, as I feel like I do with speaking, 
it, it, you just push past it. Like I keep going. I just keep telling myself, just keep going. Just tomorrow will be better. Tomorrow will be better. And I just keep going. Like I don't, it's, it's tough to say why I have this, this innate belief in myself, but I guess I just do. I've been through worse and I know what I can handle. And I know this is like a, it's a few speed bumps along the way, but this is what I meant to do. So I'm going to keep going. Awesome. Very good. Um, and you've been through a lot, uh, m more than what the average Joe has been through. You've been through some life-changing surgeries. Um, why don't you talk us about that? Like, what was the first, what was the reason why you had the surgery that you had? And if you don't mind sharing, what was it? And if you could talk a little bit about the recovery process behind it. Yeah, for sure, John. So I had a brain hemorrhage in 2014. Um, I started having these headaches that were really bad in London where my vision would go spotty or my sight would just go black. Um, so I knew something was kind of wrong here. This isn't a normal behavior. I went to A&E, which is accident and emergency twice. They ran some tests. They thought it was vertigo. They gave me some pills and they sent me home. They told me if the headaches were to continue, I should get my eyes checked in an optometrist. So I did. I was in the middle of an exam there when the optometrist, he stopped it. Mr. Patel stopped it. He gave me a sealed envelope, not a casual move, and told me to go directly to Moorfield Hospital, which I did. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Well, first I stopped at home to grab my Jack Reacher book by Lee Child and a phone charger and a bite to eat as I figured I'd be in for a bit of a wait and I wanted something to, to read and to eat. They ran the same tests at Moorfield Hospital and asked me to Charing Cross Hospital in a matter of like six hours. It turns out I had a dangerous buildup of pressure in my brain caused from a non-cancerous cyst. They need to operate and have brain surgery the next day. So I dropped an email to the folks in Canada expressing the old, I'm having brain surgery tomorrow, just FYI, uh, and called my manager and messaged a few friends. Don't think I'll be on Monday, I told them. My mom was in the air flying to London on June 21st, 2014 when I was on the operating table. Something went wrong and I had a massive bleed in the brain, a brain hemorrhage. I think that the cyst burst when they operated. My mom lands and finds I'm in critical condition. I was in a coma for four weeks, but was in and out of consciousness for months after that. It was pretty dicey, touch and go. Uh, when I was in the hospital, I had to keep my core temperature down below 40 degrees. Otherwise, there'd be more brain damage. The brain hemorrhage had damaged the parts of the brain that regulate this. So I was put underneath ice blankets above and below me to keep my core temperature down. This led to violent shivering. This lasted on and off for about a week. Um, I woke up from the coma with my mom, brother, and dad standing around me, confused. And I couldn't speak because I had a tracheotomy that helped me breathe during the, the coma that I was in. So I couldn't speak to them. And, I, and I, <laughs> I'm trying to talk, but I can't talk. And I point to my brother and go, you, give me a pen and paper. So I wrote down, get me out of here and i gave it to camera go do it bud like just, just make it happen i figured that you know i i didn't have the the medical coverage you needed to cover this so let's get out of there before this this blows off needless to say i was in the hospital for months after that so that was a pretty uh half-baked idea but it all kicked off rather quickly and it led to months of rehab i had to really learn how to walk talk and smile again uh, i was in rehab for uh, well, I was out of work for about a year and then came back to work. And then, um, you know, grueling rehab to get back to work. Like walking took, getting into the wheelchair took 30 minutes, then 25, then 20, then 15, then 10, then 7, then 8, then 10, then 12. Like it was uh, an uphill battle every way you slice it. There's one story I'd like to share with you, John, that just kind of showcases the mindset I used to, to navigate this process, about, if I may. Would that be okay? Absolutely. So I call this story constructive optimism. It's a way of reframing how you look at your setback, okay? So walking in Tooting Broadway was, I was really excited for it because I was out of the hospital. I, I built up from the wheelchair to the Zimmer frame to the Ferrari to naked walks. I've kind of gamified this whole walking process, right? Time to walk in Tooting Broadway. I got a cane. I got an eye patch. Bring it on. Let's go. I turn the corner into Broadway. I just get bumped into by someone. Okay, cool. Someone else cuts me off. 
someone's been stabbed on the sidewalk. He's just bleeding there. I'm walking around this guy. Like it's a wild place to learn to walk. Toon Brahm is what they call up and coming, John, which means it's dodgy as, but it's got a hint of potential for the future. So you never know what's going to happen in a few years, but it's not been coming for 10 years to give me an idea of what's going on here. So initially I was really dejected by this. Like this is the worst place to learn how to walk in the world. This place sucks. Bump into me, crash past me. This place is horrible. Then one day my perspective shifted, right? This isn't the worst place to learn how to walk in the world. This is the best place. If I can walk here, I can walk anywhere. And my mood reflected that. Bump into me, crash past me. Good, bring it on. You're making me better. Now tuning probably didn't change, right? It's still still up and coming, as they call it now, John. We went from the worst to the best in my head, and my mood reflected that. I began looking forward to my walks. Bump into me, crash past me. Good, bring it on. I'm getting better at this. Now, how did I come to this realization about you know this perspective shift? How did I make my, myself undergo this perspective shift? Great question, John. I'm glad you asked it. Um, I had a lot of time on my backside in the hospital, right? Like flat out, I couldn't walk. And I thought, what what's making this the worst place in the world? Well, the, the adversity, the hardship, the struggle, the strife, all the list of things like the, the guy bleeding on the sidewalk, the the dirtiness, like the 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 chaos of the nature, like it's just it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff happening here. It's like a coffee and stuff, sounds, experiences and experience like uh, things you're taking on board. And I said, well, what if that makes it the best, not the worst? Because I'm training this environment that makes it the best, not the worst. And as soon as that light bulb went off in my head, John, I realized, you know what? It is the best. It's not the worst. And every day after that, I began to look forward to my walks and take on that adversity, that strife, that struggle. The way you look at it is half the battle. I say in one of my talks, like, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. It's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. Now, facing tune Broadway... You know, I could have viewed that as the worst place on my walk in the world, but I chose to look at it as the best. And I reacted to it in a way that's positive and enjoyed that that abrasive nature and that strife, which was um it was challenging. Don't get me wrong, it was not easy to walk in Tune Broadway, but it was simple to know that I'm going to walk in Tune Broadway. And when your mind tells yourself that's what you're doing, your body follows. This isn't the worst, this is the best. If you can do that in life, like that's that's an unlock. Because if you can make what you're doing less less suck, you're gonna look forward to it and not not be so jaded by the adversity and strife that you're facing that you'll actually look forward to it and be like, you know what? This is making me better. That's a long tangent wind of describing what happened to me, John. But there was lots of ups and downs, let's say at the very least. Lots of struggles, lots of hard fought wins, lots of losses, lots of wins, and it's been an uphill battle. Call me with me as a speaker now in Vancouver. But that's also a good, that's also a sign of a really resilient person. Like I just watched a TED talk of uh, a quote unquote resilience expert. I don't even know what that is. Uh, I think everybody is resilient uh, as a resilient expert in their own, in their own means. But she was basically saying exactly what you just explained, being able to take the, shitty crappy environment and say how can i make the best out of this how can i turn it to my advantage and you showed that in spades i mean to learn how to walk over people that are just you know bleeding on the sidewalk or just you know stabbing themselves with something with some form of syringe that's uh and make it this is the best place for me i mean that just shows a different level of resilience that was all mental, right? Like, this is just me thinking in the hospital bed. How can I make this not suck so bad? How can I look forward to my walks? And like, it was like, well, I got to think about it differently. And when you shift your perspective, well, this is the worst. No, it's the best. Man, that opens up the world for you because you begin to look, to look forward to your walks and the strife to struggle. Resilience expert, sure. Like, it's, I don't, I don't know if you can learn this without going through it, if I'm honest, like, Obviously, the speaker's probably been through some adversity or struggle or strife. Um, but resilience for me is not about this is how it should be. It's, I'm telling you how this is how it was for me. Now, your experience may be different, but like I, I did this in my experience and my my experience is this to me. I um, 
and there's been tons of stuff like this. Like I lost my job this this past summer, and I gave myself. Sorry, jump around here, but John, I gave myself like a lunch to go feel sorry for myself. I have a couple margaritas, and I realized what a great opportunity this is for me to start my speaking career and to dive in this full steam. I wouldn't have had the balls to jump out of the helicopter and chase down this parachute while I had a safe job to rely on. But now that I don't, now I can go hard in the paint and chase this down. Like, now that's not to say like always like at least at least you didn't have this or like always look at the bright side. But that's a bit naive and a bit um, rose colored to look at life that way. But in every bit of suck, there's some sort of good that can come from it. And I'm just saying, just shift your perspective, look at the good. Like now I'm chasing down this, this um, now I am a speaker. I spoke at a school on, on Monday, I'm speaking next Friday at, at West, West Fan Football Club. Like I'm speaking there on a regular basis. And like, I wouldn't have had the stones to do this on my own had this not happened to me. So like everything in life has got this good and the bad. It's just how you choose to look at it. Um, now I know that you mentioned that you're, having to move back from Florida to, to be back to Toronto. Yeah. And that's not going to be a pleasant time in November. I'll tell you that much, but maybe that's this will lead nice. to some big opportunity for you. Right. Like this, this is a way to look at things like, like it sucks. It does suck. I'm not trying to say it doesn't suck. It's not fair. You're right. It's not fair, but like wishing something didn't happen is not an adequate way to address it and to get better from it. So not to use your example as like a, a talking point here, John, but like, let's see. Let's see how it turns out, man. It's not the best right now. Obviously, November in Toronto is not going to be a fun place to be. I'll tell you that much. I'm you on the do. West Coast now, so I'm avoiding the snow if I can, although it's snowy today. <laughs> yeah, I can um, see that. <laughs> but it's, um, let's see. You don't know how the cards are going to lay out yet. It's not fun right now, but like, let's let it unfold and see how it plays, if that makes sense. Oh, I um, I know there's a reason why I have to go back. Like you said, it's not fun. It's not the decision. It's not the outcome that I want. But sometimes it's not in my hands to do what I want. It's something that I have to do, something that I need to do. Um, you talked about something, and I'm you made you 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 tickled my curiosity uh, when you said it naked walks what are yeah. they great question john so naked walks are walking without supporter aids when i learned to walk in i moved from the zimmer frame which is a four post lurcher that you kind of lurch around the hallways in to the ferrari which is a four-wheeled walker that's got wheels on it. you can go fast you can waddle around quickly on it then i moved up to something called naked walks now naked walks are walking without supporter aids. You're walking naked. You'll notice a gamification of stuff here, right? Like naked walks, Ferrari. Do you remember frame? I couldn't think of something good with that. That was just, that just plain sucked. <laughs> just plain sucked. Okay. But I'm having fun here and I'm making life more enjoyable to address this stuff. Like the Ferrari was fun. The naked walks were cool because I'm grooving, I'm jiving, I'm vibing. And I moved into the, the walks and tuned Broadway. And that was an adjustment. Like, I'll be honest with you, that 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 first three days really sucked. Getting bumped into and cut off and, and dealing with the hecticness of tuning Broadway, like it's, it's madness. But eventually you find a way through, you find a way to make it less suck. So naked walks were a progression of me walking and the, and the step before I walked on tuning Broadway. So it's more on the lines of, uh, like, like you said, like removing the comfort zone, the, removing yourself from the, what you're comfortable with and putting yourself in more um, challenging situations. Yeah, well, the progression of walking, like you had to go from like the Ferrari, which is a, which is a walker with like wheels, to walking without any support aids before we could walk on the hall, or the, the streets of Toon Broadway. So I was walking. There's a great video of me just kind of jiving and walking and um enjoy walking without anything to hold me up except myself which is pretty cool because that's it took me probably six seven months to do that right like i was in a wheelchair for six seven months so walking without supporter aids was a big deal for me and that's why i kind of came up with this big term of a naked walk to go for a naked walk was was a big thing for me and i progressed to walking into broadway very cool very cool and 
where I was trying to go with this is that is as you can actually use this, like, for example, like I'm about to do a naked walk. Like I'm about to go to, I'm about to leave my entire family behind my entire support system, my whole support structure behind. And I'm going to go back to a city where I don't want to go, but I'm going by myself. And it's scary. It's, it's one scary as hell Two. It's uh, because I'm going to be on, I will literally be on my own. No, my, like my, my, my family has always been close to me whenever I needed them. But now it's like, cut the cord by myself. I still yeah. have some friends and family there back in Toronto, but one, it's scary to do it. I'm sure. used to doing scary. I'm used to it because I've done it so many times before. Not like this. Not at this, not at this extreme, but I could see how somebody who's been on a walker to remove that support, to start walking by themselves in a shady area. It's scary. What would, how would you, how would you come across, what would you say to somebody who's going through something similar, who hasn't been through that before? That's a good question, John. I think you got to jump in and just try it. Cause like, no matter what you think about it, it's always going to be different when you go in there and experience it. So walk in to Broadway, you can plan out the wazoo, but as soon as you get bumped by that first guy on the street, you know, your whole plan goes out the window. You know, that, that famous quote from my Mike Dwight Tyson, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. You can plan all you want, but as soon as you hit that first punch, you know, your plan's out the window, bud. Like you're walking into Tune Broadway, brother. It's so like moving to Toronto, for instance, like, yeah, it's going to suck. Like winter's not the ideal time to move to Toronto for sure. And it's not going to be easy, but like, just take it one step at a time and like, get your flat sorted out. Like get yourself set up like for the gym, get a good exercise routine. Like routine's so big for me. And I would really recommend that you try a routine, a morning routine. Like every day I wake up, I go for a workout, I go for a cold shower, I meditate, full breakfast onto, um, my day's activities, which involves your podcast today. But like, I really get into your body. Mood follows action, I believe. So get yourself set up in Toronto. Get a routine that's going to serve you. A workout routine and maybe try meditation. I'm not sure if you can do that at all. But just, just trust the process. As cheesy as that sounds, like just the process is what everything is. Like it's not what the results are. It's the process of being better. Every day now I'm working on better in myself, better than yesterday is something that I always believe in. And you make little gains here and there. They're not always the most monstrous gains, but as long as you can improve it from the day before, that's a win. And they compound over days, weeks, months, and years. So moving to a new city is not easy. It's never fun, especially in the wintertime. It's not going to be easy at all. But what can you control? You can control, you know, your flat, your body, you know, getting your, getting your body out of your head, work into your body and like your mood will fall action i guarantee you that that's what i recommend there john very cool well this is going to be the second country that i move i've moved beginning of the year to florida now at the end of the year i'm moving back to toronto so it's a interesting time in my life so like i said like I, i'm no stranger to this it's it's just i know a lot of people they'll they'll see that change that they want to do and it's just so scary for them that they won't do it out of fear because they're afraid to fail. And my follow-up question to you is how important is it for somebody to dip their toe into that fear so that they can learn how to fail? That's a great question, John. Thank you for asking that. I think failure is a big part of my vibe now. Like I'm not, I know some people say like, Dan, you're fearless. It's like, no, I'm not fearless. I just choose, I see the fear. I feel it. I just choose to go forward anyways. Like you can never go around an obstacle or a difficulty in your life. You always have to go through it. And it's important to know because like you try to skate through like, oh, I can just avoid this by going around this big, big hairy um, obstacle in my way, but really you have to go through it to, to, to conquer it. And I've realized that with my life, it's like, I got to go through this stuff as much as scary as it is to go through it. When you go through it, you realize, oh my God, why didn't I just do this before? It's so much easier to go through this. So what would I say to someone who's tamed with fear? Like, I mean, maybe start with smaller, less consequential obstacles that aren't going to be a death blow should they, should they fail. 
before you ramp up to the one that you want to succeed with. But I think getting a happy, healthy appetite with with fear and with failure is quite with quite good. Like I fail all the time now, John. I fail all the time, and like I'm not I'm not feeling about this much anymore. Like I used to feel about these big moonshot spaces and, and areas where I just missed like a total flop, total total failure. Now I'm missing my little bits and I'm hitting sometimes. And it's like, it's you can see the improvement come and it's just like trusting the process of just always going after it and never stopping. I'm never satisfied until I get it done. And it's not done until I win. So it's like, to get that in your mindset, I, don't, I can't tell you how to do that, but the feeling of doing something when you couldn't do it before and you do it afterwards is a pretty damn good feeling. And if you can do that one time, I guarantee you'll be hooked. I I know that feeling all too well, all too well. My whole move down here was probably the biggest gamble I've ever taken. It didn't turn out the way I wanted to, but I also learned a lot of valuable lessons down here. I saw people for who they are, how they treat me, how, and every, I just saw everything. So it's like, now I have all this tool set. I can go back and I can do whatever I need to do on my terms. So for me, like when, it, when people tell me that I'm like, <laughs> fail, fail often, fail quickly. Fail quickly. That's the best way to go about it. Cause when you fail, if you want to change tact, it's good to fail. No, you can fail off the hop, but if you don't know that you can invest a lot of time and chase this down the road that maybe it's a bit too difficult to turn around from, but failure is a huge part of my life. Like I, I fail all the time. There's this great, do you know Jocko Willink at all? Oh, yeah. I love Jocko. It's a great clip on YouTube that's called Good. Have you ever seen this Good video? Oh, it's one good. of my favorite videos. <laughs> so, yes, for those that don't know, it's like just this, you know, you'll say something, something bad happens to him, and Jocko will always say good. More time to get better. Good. More time to do this. So like, I went to a coffee shop in London a little while ago, a couple years back now, and I had my headphones. I'm just about to, I'm walking out the door, and they go, boop, power off. And instantly I go, good. I can charge them back at the flat. Should I have been at the coffee shop, I would have been without headphones for the next three or four hours. But that instant reframe of this is good, not bad, happened automatically, which is pretty cool, I thought. And like that's, if you can get your mind around that process of just, you know, not happening to you, but for you, then life gets a lot easier. Like your, your strike's not as difficult. Your, the, 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 the dark's not as cold. The sun's more bright. Like, it sounds a bit cheesy and a bit woohoo, but like, I don't know, man. Like, it just makes life easier for you. Like, why, why not do it? I'm telling you, this works. Mm -hmm. Look at my story. Look what I've been through, and I'm telling you, this works. Like, why, why wouldn't you believe it? I've gotten here. I didn't think I could get back to this stage. Like, if you told me, if you told my 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 nurses and my doctors like where I'd be at this stage in my life, they would have laughed at you. Well, I don't know if they would have laughed at you because they're doctors, but I don't think they thought this was possible. I um I skied this past winter, um, John, and like it all started from a goal back in my chair and cross days at the hospital when I was working with the even bars and the rehab team. And they asked me, what did I want to get back to doing? Now the even bars just where you hold the sound like you hold and you're unstable on your feet. And I told them I wanted to go back to ski. And they paused and thought about it for a second. They go, okay. That was a simple thing that was said. Eight years ago, right? When I was in Charing Cross Hospital. I was in a wheelchair at the stage. So like skiing was like, yeah, right, bud. Like, sure, sure. I'm sure we can do that for you. Last winter, I skied. You know, I ripped some turns and I did it because I said I was going to do it. And it wasn't easy to get there, but I was able to do it. And if you told my rehab team that I did that, I bet you they would be flabbergasted because... When I told them I do this, I was in a wheelchair and it was a fleeting thing, like a simple exercise to get me thinking about future goals. And I worked tooth and nail to make this happen. I can, I will, I must kind of vibe. And like, I ripped it up last year, man. It was great. That's awesome. That's, that's, and it's a, like, that's, that's huge. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry? No, go ahead. I was just saying that's that's a huge accomplishment from going from not being able to walk to skiing again. I mean... I don't ski because I'm just afraid to hug a tree while I'm going mm -hmm. on the way down and do like uh tum tumbling. <laughs> yeah, it was snowball. um it was a, a big milestone. It was the happiest day I've had in, in the past eight years. 
Cause they could go fast again, right? Like I could go fast again. And I, you know, I used to be a pretty good skier. I used to ski race. I was an instructor after uni for a season. Like I was big on the hill and used to instruct. And when this all happened, you everything gets taken away from you. You can't walk, you can't talk, you can't smile. I still got double vision today, which means I see two of you. Lucky me. But skiing with double vision is not easy at all, but like it's possible. And none of this is easy, but it's simple to know that I'm doing this. Like I'm gonna go ski again. Which is like a ridiculous thing to say. It's a moonshot goal, man. A moonshot goal. But like, here I am skiing. Like, I did this. Why, why can't you? I'm no better than you or anyone listening to this podcast. Like, I said I was going to do it and I did it. I just got on with it and trusted the process. Like, I got to work on the balance board in the gym. Like, I'm building this up slowly but surely and like, and just building myself in a position where I can actually execute this and deliver. Like, it, it, you can do it, man. You can do it. And like, I'm going to go back skiing this year again, which is pretty cool. It's not like a one and done. This is like, I'm a skier. I'm going to go back skiing. And like, I don't know. It's um, how you view it is everything, right? Like, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. And that's the name of the game, if that makes sense. It does. But I want to ask you something. Do you think that people take um, their abilities for granted? Because it sounds like you don't take your abilities for granted at all. You you seize the day, carpe diem. You seize your opportunities. And it just, it sounds like a lot of people out there, they're missing out on a whole lot of different opportunities if they just focus a little bit. It's a great expression, John, that I love, and I'll share with you and your listeners now. It's the sick man wants one thing. The healthy man wants a thousand things. When you're sick, all you want is that one thing you can't have, to not be sick anymore. When you're healthy, you want everything under the sun, a new job, a new commute, a new career, new gadgets, new car, whatever have you, like endless amount of stuff you want. But when you get that taken away, all you want is just to be like healthy again. When I couldn't walk, all I wanted was to walk again. When you get all this stuff taken away from you, you realize how valuable and important this is. And we do take it for granted. I took it for granted. I'm not above this. When it's easy and it's there, you just take it. And you just take it for granted because it's always going to be there, right? Well, I realize it's not always going to be there. And you get it taken away. And when you, like, that first day back on the ski hill, man, like, riding the gondola up, feeling the frost on your cheeks, the sun beating down your face, and hearing the crunch under your feet, and you're back on the slopes, man, that's like, that's the that's the juice, that's what you're chasing. That's what I'm doing this for. It's like that little, the juice is worth the squeeze. Like it, it's, it's, you realize what's important in life and you can't really appreciate that unless it's taken away from you because it's always going to be there, right? Well, it's not always going to be there. And sometimes it's not. And then sometimes you can't get it back. But I was able to take it back because I could remember that feeling of skiing. I could remember that feeling of like going fast and being on the edge of control and being on the mountain. Like it's, 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 it's something you got to appreciate every day. And like, when you go back up the hill, let me tell you, man, I was, you can wipe that smile off my face. If you try, like I was just having the best day ever. So yeah, people take it for granted. How can you not take it for granted? Maybe know that you can have it taken away or you have to experience this. I don't know how else to tell you like how to avoid that, that pitfall, but it's, um, yeah, I think we do take it for granted. If that makes sense. It, 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 it's, it's a hard pitfall. Uh, and as much as I don't want to say it, most people have to have to live through it. Most people have to live through getting everything that you have taken away from you. I've had, I've, I've danced with bankruptcy twice in my life. So I know what it means to like have nothing living, living with your parents in your parents' basement for years upon years upon years. I know what it means not being able to see the light of day. So I know I appreciate the stuff that I have to go through. And when, it, when things come to me, I appreciate them. But it almost feels like people just have to live through it. Yeah, I don't know if you can teach this because unless you feel it, you're not going to know it. It's like, yeah, sure. The, I shouldn't take this for granted. It's like, well, 
Like, yeah, you shouldn't, man. Like, I lost a friend of mine two weeks ago to cancer and like, she was such a bright light and such a vibrant personality and, and someone that I really, really stood by me a lot during this whole rehab process in, in the hospital and, and she passed from cancer and it's just like, man, she got got by this? Like, that's pretty unfair. But life isn't unfair. Life isn't fair. It doesn't care what you, what you're, what you've done or what you like, what you're owed. Like, you don't owe shit. And like, you got to live your life every day. Like it, it could be your last, like that sounds really cheesy. Cause it's like carpe diem, all this stuff. But like, but like, you got to be about it, man. You can't talk about it. You got to be about it. And like, it may be a taken away tomorrow. It's not fair. It's not fair. You're right. It's not fair. And what do you expect to have happened from this? Like I had a second setback, John. I don't know if I told you this in the preamble, but like I made it back to work after eight months of recovery and um, made it back to work for two months not doing a whole bunch of work, to be honest. I was kind of catching up with emails and and doing all that noise. And then a second setback. And by setback, I mean, I was found unconscious in my flat by my mom. And they had to call an ambulance. And I was rushed to emergency brain surgery. I got a medical alert bracelet on my wrist now. They found unconscious, checked for a malfunctioning VP shunt, which is what I had. So I woke up again in the hospital, hearing the beeping noise of the heart rate monitor, and just asking what what had happened. Well, then you had a second brain injury, like you had his bracket, second brain surgery. We got the, the blockage, so don't worry, but we got the second brain surgery happened. So, so all my progress is washed away. It's like, well, you're alive. I'm like, but but I'm back in the hospital. It's like, what, what do you mean? It's like, well, you're gonna be in the hospital for the next two weeks to recover. And when I got out of the hospital, I wasn't entitled to go back to rehab because I already tapped that vein. We're talking about low, man. Like, I've been working for a year to get back to work. And it's taken away like that again. This is the second time. I described my recovery like a W. So the first, first pitfall is down here. Back to work up here. The second pitfall is not here where the first one was, but much lower. I call it the depths of the human experience. This is where your, your dreams and hopes are snickered at. And oh, you, you thought you could get back here, did you, bud? <laughs> not so fast. Rip the carpet underneath you. Like this was horrifically horrible and... It was all mental game, right? I had done this once before. I knew how to get back better. But it took weeks of being down in the dumps to like get back to this perspective and to realize that it's not fair. You're right. But what's that going to do to wish it didn't happen? Because it did happen. And I had to rebuild myself back up from this. And that was the most difficult part of this operation was that part because all that momentum that I built up was washed away in a single instant. And I was back to square one. Because I had lost a year and I had been working on this for a year and it was all taken away from me overnight. But I realized that I could walk again. So I was further ahead than I was in the first time. I knew the ins and outs of rehab or like how to rehab myself so I could move back faster than I was in the past. Got back into physical exercise and activity, speech and language therapy, got back there quickly. Like you break it down into small manageable chunks. Like you don't know the whole road back to recovery, but you can see your next step and just take the next step because that's what you got to do. One foot in front of the other, and let's take it back to this. So that's like that was the lowest part for me. The first brain injury is like, yeah, it sucks, but that happens to some people. The second brain injury, man, talk about low. That's the lowest I've been in my life, and I was never depressed, but I was at the point where like you start questioning, you know, was why is this happening to me? It's a real dangerous place to be in because you think woes me, woes me, and it, it's not conductive i call this the pity spiral where you think everything is against you and everything is your fault or why is it happening to me it's like you're not that special but no one's trying to get just you this is just happening this is, this is the card you got dealt in your hand you got to play this hand and you got to navigate this in a way that's going to be helpful and like the mental fortitude it took to navigate this situation was so tentative and, and and sensitive and 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 delicate that i had to really finesse this through to get back to where i was at now but like it's all mental man yeah i totally agree with that totally 100 percent agree with that and i know the feeling i know the feeling of you know you get back up to the peak after you pretty much feel like you've lost everything and all of a sudden the rug gets pulled out of you like it was like my second time falling, falling, uh, losing my business. Cause that was even harder because I not only lost my business, I lost my future wife. 
So it was like double whammy for the first time. I just lost my business. Who cares? So it's, but like you said, you got to get back up on that horse, right? Just get back up on that horse and just uh, see what happens after. Um, Part of that is what I found and what you found is the power of morning routines. Yeah. It's a great, great bit, John. Like I love morning routines. I'm very religious with this. Like I, so Tim Ferriss, OG podcaster, self-help guru, aficionado, morning routines are his time. And he said, he swears by his morning routine. I now do as well. So my morning routine is very simple. I wake up early, go to the gym, come back for shower and the shower cold one to three minutes. Then I meditate, then I do a full breakfast and I'm on to work or what I'm doing that day. Every morning's the same. I'm religious with this and I'm militant with how I do this because it sets me up for success. I also make my bed in there, which is a key hack. I never made my bed before, but I make the bed now. And it's a fantastic way to kind of structure your day and realize, you know, the room can be messy, but it look tidy. The bed is made. And also it's the last thing you get into at night is your bed. Hey, I accomplished that in the morning. So like the morning routine is quite important for this. I swear by my morning routine now. I guess you're the same, John. 100%. 100%. I love my morning routine. So I love this morning routine. It's very um, therapeutic. It helps me kind of ramp up for my day and get momentum going and attack the day, which is kind of big. And I don't know. Today I went for a bit of a cheeky breakfast. Double French toast, bacon on the side, coffee, a la filter, a la bottomless. It's a great morning, man. I loved it. That's amazing. Um, I find that when I don't do my morning routine, my whole day is just like all over the place, like a squirrel brain of a day. So it's funny. Like I have my one non-negotiable is meditation. So every day I meditate and I've meditated for, I've got an app on my phone that tracks my habits. I meditated for how many days in a row? Um, 166 in a row. I broke my meditation streak on a stag. So was, I was a bit incapacitated in the morning after one day to meditate. So I just let that slide. But 166 in a row, is, that's a 20 minute meditation in the morning. And I just do it, save one day. But that's like, three, I don't know, probably 400 days in a row or 400 days total in the past four, four or five. Like I just, they're non-negotiables. And like, you don't get out of what you like, what you have, what you can't have, you get out of life what you have to have. So I moved back to, from London this past September, last October. So just over a year ago. And there was an issue with my, my visa I've got a European passport. I've been in London for five years, six, I've been in London for 10 years. So I've got my indefinite leave to remain on my passport. But I got a new Austrian passport and then click over to my new passport. And I emailed Her Majesty's whatever to like update this. And they said, oh, you have to go through this process to adjust your visa on your on your passport. And I'm like, well, it's never easy, right? It's, not a simple task to do this. It's like this huge amount of documents for the opportunity to move back within two years. There's a great expression that like, if you want to take the island, you got to burn the boats. And I decided I'm going to make this work in Vancouver. I'm burning the boats. Like there's no going back here. I burned the boats back to London. I didn't renew my visa. Now that's lapsed and that's no longer an option for me. I can still move back to Europe. That's fine. But London, my home for the past 10 years is gone. And that's something I made a very uh, intentional choice to not renew that. Because you're going to make this difficult for me. Like, I don't know. I don't, it's not worth my time to invest this for two years, up to two years, potentially moving back to London. Like, you're going to make those choices in life. Like, what do you want to have out of it? And be intentional with that and make that happen. Like, it's not, it's not an accident that things happen, right? It's a very intentional movement here. You, you've said something um, about momentum and I want to touch up on that because I'm not a fan of momentum. I don't like momentum. I think momentum is temporary for people. This is coming from a personal trainer's perspective. Uh, we see this every year, 
January 1st, you see all these people with amazing goals and they want to change their bodies and they want to live a healthier 20, a healthier new year. And then by, I'd say about January 12th, January 14th, the gyms are empty again. And that's just momentum um, fizzling out. And we all know this and gyms know this, and this is where they profit all the profit hugely. January, I worked in a good, in a good life. Uh, January is our most profitable month by the numbers. Yeah. So you actually say something and, and I want to touch up on it because it's a funny saying, swallow the hairy frog. What does that mean? Yeah. Great question, John. So momentum, I break it down into two parts. So first of all, I disagree with your idea of momentum. And That's I'll tell fine. you, it's all good. Why. I've got two momentums. Swallow the hairy frog is the first one. And building blocks is the second one. Swallow the hairy frog. What does this mean? I roll up to work one day with a bag, two bags. I go for a swim in the morning before it works. So I got my swim gear in one bag. I change clothes in the other. And my work stuff in the other bag. So I'm, I'm rocking the tube. I was real popular on the tube. I'll tell you that much. But my, my, my HR manager goes, what are you doing here? Why do you have all these bags? I'm like, well, I went for a swim this morning before work. She goes, oh, you swallowed the hairy frog. And I go, excuse me? You know, you, you, know, you swallowed the hairy frog. And I go, that, that's not a thing. So hair the dog is one thing. Swallow the frog is another expression. She's combined the two. Swallow the frog. If you had to swallow a frog, you do it first thing in the morning so you don't have to wait, looming over your day the whole day. Hair the dog is, you know, if you're drinking, you continue drinking the next day, but you keep it, keep the momentum going for drinking. Just combine the two of them. So I made her a mug that says swallowed hairy frog. This is picture of this, this, this frog combing his back hair. And it says swallowed hairy frog. And I sent it to her because I was making a mug from another friend of mine. But a podcast that I have called Play Loose Look Tight. And she loved the idea of this. So swallowed hairy frog is what I call Monday morning soon before work. Momentum here is diving into the deep end before you're done. Before you're halfway done, you're like, before you know you're halfway done. And you've tackled the most difficult part of that task. Swallowed hairy frog, which is like a whole thing in itself. And that's like how I position Monday morning soon before work. That's one type of momentum. The second type is building blocks. It's stacking stuff on top of each other. You're building up. So coming from the office, I have to do laundry and also make dinner. I throw a little laundry in and I start dinner and then I can sit down and chill. But I don't start that before I sit down and chill. Getting up to start that is so difficult. We've already started it. If the launch is already in, I just need to turn it over. It's much more easy to continue the process of that momentum rolling. If there's already started, it's much more easy to continue making dinner than to just start fresh anew. So momentum for me is like continuing progress and keeping that movement going. So building blocks is quite key for this. And I found it very helpful for me personally. Um, it sounds like from what you're saying there, John, that maybe discipline may be the issue over momentum because for me momentum is very much alive and well and i wouldn't say i'm a very disciplined well that's not true now i'm much more disciplined than i was in the past but i was never a disciplined kid to be honest but now i'm very disciplined in what i want to do if i say we're doing this i do this i'm disciplined with myself i keep promising myself if i say i'm going to do something i do it i told him i'll go skiing i have to go skiing that's an extreme example of like what i'm doing here but like like a cold shower every day for three minutes. It's not pleasant. It's not the best, but like, I'm going to do it. And I've told myself I'm going to do this. Turn that cold to cold is like, there's a moment where I'm like, oh, this is great. This warm coming down and that turns cold. Bam, that hits you right in the face. Like you got to have the discipline needed to do these things. And like, it's it's not easy to do it, but it's simple to know that you have to do it. Yeah. Um discipline and momentum or yeah discipline and momentum do go hand in hand and you're right people people do lack a lot of discipline i'm guilty of that as well like i'm i'm super guilty i'm no different than anybody else um i could always be more disciplined in the stuff that i do especially when it comes to going to the gym um how, how do you think somebody can help build a little bit more discipline in their life to help keep the momentum going 
And you make small promises yourself and you fulfill those promises. Don't start off by going to the gym five days a week. Start off by going one day a week. And incrementally and stack it on top of each other. You do one for like a month, add two. Then three, then five. Like, don't try to nail it all in one go. You got to build up to this. Like I started meditating in the morning with two minutes. Next week was four minutes, then six minutes, then eight minutes. Now it's 25 in the morning. No stress, No, not even an issue with that. I didn't start at 25, I started at two minutes. Don't try to swallow the hairy frog in one go. Building blocks, build it up, bud. You can't go swallow the hairy frog right up the hop. You got to build it up. That's, uh, that's really, that's really, that's a really good way of how to build a, how to build a routine. So it becomes more of like a daily routine. It becomes like a, it's easier to be, to build a habit rather than, um, a task. Yeah. And that's the key here is to like, make it easy for you to do. And like, now I meditate every day for 25 minutes. No, no, no joke, man. I'm not even like, it's not even an issue for me. It's easy. I was never a meditator growing up, but I've now adapted this habit. So now I just do this. I'm a meditator. Very cool. Uh, we're coming up close to the end of the show. And these are the seven or eight questions I ask all my guests. Sure. Um, I just like to get your perspective on these seven or eight topics. With the, with the increase in people suffering from depression from the lockdowns, well, from the constant uncertainty that we've been living through for the last two to three years, what would be the one thing that you could tell them to keep their hopes up? Mood follows action. Get into your body and watch your mood follow. What's the one thing that you do daily that amplifies your ability to stay focused? Meditation. Easy. <laughs> if you could pick up the phone right now and call yourself at 20 years old, what would you tell yourself? Ask for forgiveness, not for permission, unless it's for someone's time. And ask for permission always. Looking back, would you change anything? Probably, but you know what? I'm exactly where I need to be right now. And I'm happy with that. I'm comfortable with that answer. What scares you? What scares me? Living a life that I'm less than capable of. Where do you see McQueenDan.com in the next five years? Well, I'm hopefully going to have a TED, TED Talk by then. Turn away clients because I've got too much business to go around. Um, I can, I will, I must. Awesome. Awesome. How about you personally? Where do you see you personally in the next five years? Wildly successful speaker, podcast host. I'm going to get my podcast back rolling again. Uh, I really enjoy doing the podcast and that's something that's been a bit of a void in my life right now. And just do what I want to do every day and making it happen. Like I'm not going to stop. Very good. Uh, where can people find more about you? Uh, McQueen Dan across the socials and also McQueenDan.com. Awesome. That's and, way to reach out to me. And we will post all of the links that you have given us in the show notes so everybody has easy access to you, your content, how to book you for speaking events and all that, all that great stuff. Right on, brother. Thank you. Any final thoughts? Life happens for you, not to you. Get after it and earn it every day. Dan, thank you so much. Uh, you have an inspirational story. Uh, when, when I saw your story on uh, Podmatch, where I first got introduced to you, I was like, oh my God, I have to get this guy on. I We have to have a conversation. Because when it came to... Um, resilience your picture should be right next to that word in the in the webster's dictionary because yeah. nobody has been more resilient in in your struggle in your story than i have ever met so thank, thank you so you much for lot, saying, man. it's very on. impressive to hear and like it's it's never going to be easy but it's simple to do it it's simple to know you keep going it's like when you're facing this this hardship, right? It's not going to be an easy road to do, but it's simple to know that you're going right here. 
And right just happens to be straight uphill and just keep going. Don't stop. You only lose if you stop. Yeah. You keep going, you don't lose. So that's why I tell these guys, just keep going. Yeah. Going through hard times is just a test. What you need to know is that when you get out of whatever you're going through, you will be stronger than ever before. And you know, and you don't need to go through it alone. Always know that you are not alone. Stay tuned for more real people with amazing stories that are just like yours. Until then, to everyone out there listening, I wish you a good morning, good afternoon, or good night, wherever you may be in this crazy world. Hey, everybody, John Catalvo is from Resilient Reboot Productions. Uh, I want you guys to be able to access all the content that we're putting out with Resilient Reboot Productions, and we're moving it to a very special location. So I don't want you guys to miss out on the chance to become a uh, become part of the vibrant and supportive Resilient Reboot Productions community. Join us today and connect with like-minded individuals who are passionate about personal development, mindset, resilience, and growth. By becoming a member, you'll gain access to a wealth of valuable resources, including exclusive content, live events, and discussion forums where you can share your thoughts and insights on the latest podcast episodes. Take action now and join our community to start your journey towards a more fulfilling and resilient life.